We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and that was hungry. And now we've started the second half of the season. And not really with a bang, more of a... Huh? Yeah. I mean, not a bang unless you're Max Verstappen, but... Uh, yeah. Like, but, um, but yeah, no, not super exciting at all. No, no, it was it was not the most memorable of races that, that we're always going to think back to, which I also think really does a disservice to the fact that, like, this is Oscar Piastri's maiden Formula One victory, which should be really, really exciting. But instead, it's just kind of like, that happened... And we'll get yeah. into like the McLaren of it all. I think we're going to have a, a lot about that to talk about. But yes. I, I really think that the way a lot of things were handled this weekend did a disservice to Oscar, which is very disappointing. Yeah, it was it was a very forget forgetful weekend, but it shouldn't be because it's Oscar's first first podium or first, first win, not his first podium. That is a natural yeah. race because he did win a sprint last season, but his first race win. And to bring up your point that he won a sprint race last year, that was also overshadowed by Max clinching the world championship in that same sprint race. This so this poor guy just can't win. No, he he really even when he does, he doesn't. But speaking of other people who don't win, to just dive into news real quick, and I wanted to just point this out that when they announced Kevin Magnuson was going to be leaving Haas at the end of the season. It was about one o'clock in the morning in California, and I had just finished uploading our episode, and I was about to go to bed, and then I open up Instagram for whatever reason and see, boom, he's leaving, it's official, and I'm just like, really? That just happened. Yeah. That, we knew it was going to happen, though. We called right, it. Right, right. If yeah, you listen to our episode, we 100% called that as soon as the episode's out, it's it's going to be up. So at least and we're it, and it getting was. better at calling these things. <laughs> at, at, at least, at least we know this. And I mean, we, we knew that the, the likelihood of Magdalene staying at Haas was going to be very, very slim, especially with Esteban Ocon waiting in the wings. And potentially that news will be out, you know, next week in Belgium. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bummer. Like he just got fired from the same team twice, but it's also not surprising. No. And the one thing about this that was surprising to me is that Espen Ocon's contract was not announced because I, I thought it would have made more sense to announce he's leaving and he's coming in all in one mm -hmm. weekend. Like we don't have this seat. It's being filled by SD. Um, but who knows? I don't know how they choose to run their PR, but. That's I mean, I it doesn't thinking. make it any less awkward for, for Magnuson. Like mm -hmm. it, it's just. It, it it is what it is, and I mean there there were some some rumors that you know Esteban Ocon did a seat fit for Williams, which he did do the seat fit, but they're not looking at him for next year; they're looking at him for eventually year here, um, which I think is also kind of interesting that they're they're working on that now when they you know Williams does need to figure out who their second driver is going to be for twenty twenty five. This is what they're doing, be. Catherine. They're literally hmm. fitting everyone for a seat everyone. because they don't know who they're going to take because Carlos signs. Would rather watch the Euros than make a decision. <laughs> oh my God. When when he said that, I think I sent it to you and I said, like, thanks, I hate it. But yeah, I mean, I know that, you know, Carlos is like looking for a big like a bigger seat, a bigger team, and obviously, and we'll talk about it, you know, there there's, you know, some vulnerability in that second seat at Red Bull right now. And then there's also the, you know, turnaround with what Toto Wolf's been saying about the second seat at Mercedes. But Carlos needs to do something. And I also think that when it comes to Williams, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if we see Botas make his return to, to Williams. I think it'd be awkward as heck, but I think that might be what happens. Yeah, I'd love to see him and James work together again. No, oh, that'd be funny. Valtteri, it's James. Hey, James, it's Valtteri. Valtteri. Uh, um, dead. But speaking yeah, of the second seat for Mercedes, it's been rumored to me Antonelli actually like admitted and came out saying that he may not be ready for F1, which I think is really interesting. He, you know, he's been saying he's still struggling in F2. We've mentioned that he's not, you know, a superstar in F2. Um, so the seat might be a little bit more wide open than we were thinking. And I really want Carlos to take this seat just because that's really the only upper mid upper tier 
team that needs a driver. I think Carlos needs to be at a more competitive team than Williams, like we've been saying. But I just think it's interesting. And Catherine, I want to get your take on it too. Obviously, that's why we're here. Um, But he came out and openly admitted that he may not be ready. He's super, super young. So I think this is him, you know, being really smart about it and knowing where he's at in his career and that maybe he needs more time to develop. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that because the last thing that you would want to do is go to, you know, F1 from F2 and not be ready and it just ruins all chances and you have one season and you burn out and that's the end of your career. Right, exactly. Like no, nobody wants to see a rookie crash and burn, but we've seen so many rookies lately do just that. I mean, if you look at, you know, Mick Schumacher, Nik- Nikita Mazepin, Nicholas Latifi, even, you know, honestly, Logan Sargent. They have it. Nick performed. DeVries. Nick DeVries, exactly. And he wasn't even a, like a straight from F2 kind of rookie. Um, but, but yeah, and I mean, even to say, and I want to point out that Antonelli did win the feature race in Budapest today as well. So he's moved up in the standings. He's currently P6 um, behind Cola Pinto, who he, te- he did the rookie session for Williams, I think last week, who's in P5. Um, yeah. But like none of the guys, like, like I said, none of the guys in F2 who are like, being actively considered are actually you know lighting it up in the standings like Isaac Hadjar who's a Red Bull driver who did um he he did a a rookie session earlier this season he's in the lead um in the championship by 18 points um but there's nothing about him him moving up so it's very interesting and you know to to continue our point of does f2 adequately prepare a driver for f1 which we have extensively discussed the answer being no um i think that it's smart for antonelli to not want himself to throw in you know want to throw himself into the fire especially to be the guy taking lewis hamilton's former seat i know like that's that's also a really, you know, big deal. Those are big shoes to fill. And we know that, you know, Mercedes is driving a lot better right now. Um, but I, I think that this is another signal that Mercedes is looking in a different direction. But I also think that it's a signal that, like, Kimi Antonelli is not upset about that. Um, you know, what he, he might be a little disappointed, like that wouldn't surprise me at all, but I don't think that like, this is the end of the world for him because he's still like the second coming of Michael Schumacher and, and you know, as an Italian in, in an F2 car. Um, but he, you know, he does, I think he needs a little bit more time to develop. This isn't like when Max Verstappen came to Formula One at 17. Yeah. And do you think this is like damaging to him as a prospect by saying he's not ready? I don't think so, um, because I, I think that, you know, the, the biggest options are A, give him the, the Mercedes seat or B, give him the Williams seat and do the, you know, do what they did with George. But I also don't think that that's as much of an option with the direction that James Vowles is taking Williams. And I think that right. they really want to, you know, they really want a, you know, a higher tier guy, which is why they're going after Carlos. Or, and then they were like very full court press for a while until Carlos decided that he'd rather watch the football tournament. Um, but I, I think that, you know, Even, you know, even if we're saying not now, that doesn't mean not ever like it would for a number of other drivers. And I think that there are still going to be more opportunities for Antonelli to come into F1. Um, But I think that, you know, the smartest thing for Mercedes is to not bring him up yet. Yeah. And Williams, too, because they've Williams has shown a little bit of interest. But I I like the direction that James Wilde to go off track of it. But I like the direction that he's taking it where it's he's like, we don't want to be a feeder team. We want to stand on our own and be our own team. Because I mm-hmm. think that's going and trending in the opposite direction of what like V-Carb and Red Bull are doing. Especially now that there's like the ties are closer in the names even. And it's like, oh, well, Checo C, it'll go to Danny. We we'll, probably won't go to Yuki, but we'll just take someone from that team and put them on this team. Like they're so interchangeable where it's really Mm -hmm. just one big team. I know it's not, but it feels that way. Whereas Williams, I think is really working on branching away from Mercedes and being its own standalone team. And they want to have success on their own. Yeah. Which I, I really like for them. You know, Williams is, you know, a team with like such a rich history that they just, it's something that we haven't seen in, in, you know, in a while. And I think that, you know, James Vowles really has them on that trajectory to get them back to those like former days of, of more glory. Um, and it's, it's going to take a minute, but I, I don't 
think that they want Antonelli and they don't want to still be in that position of being a theater team. So I, I do think that this opens up doors for Carlos Sainz for whatever he wants to choose. This opens the doors for maybe, you know, Esteban Ocon doesn't go to Haas and he goes to, to that second Mercedes seat. Valtteri Botas goes back to Mercedes. We we don't know, you know, what what is, is, is going to happen clearly because we've tried to predict this and, you know, it's just it's just going to happen and we're just waiting for it. It's Carlos's world. We're just we're waiting. We're just living in it. Yep. Yeah. Um, but in something that is not Carlos's world, and that is a, a world, um, former Formula One driver Pascal Wehrlein won the Formula E championship also today. Um, there were going into the weekend in at the London E Prix, which there were there are two races, runs 15 and 16. There were like seven different guys who could win the championship going into like the final weekend, which is wild um but Verline won round 15 and then finished p2 in the season finale which was enough to give him uh the title which formula e is not my favorite racing series but you know it's, it's a championship and i i sometimes it's on cbs sports when there's like nothing else on they'll, they'll have like the replay one of my my least favorite um Sky Sports commentators does the commentary for it, um, but they they break to commercials so much. Like one of the be benefits of watching Formula One, ra ra one of the benefits of watching Formula One races live, you know, in the U.S. is they do run them commercial free. Um, if you're watching, I love the replay, how you they specified. Do have commercials. I love how you specified in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, because when I was watching on um, ESPN in uh, when I was in Chile. Yeah. All of a sudden, it was a commercial, and I was like, "Kevin, what's going on? They're showing commercials. This isn't this isn't how it works." Yeah, thanks. I hate that too. I it like it's just it's so hard to get into Formula E because it's broken up by so many commercials, yeah. which we don't have on ESPN um, or you know the the Sky feed that I watch on F1 TV. Um, Anyway, that's that's the, the news we got. Congratulations to Veriline, who couldn't make it in Formula One but can do the electric series, which is very loud um that's that's kind of the 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 way i can describe formula e is it's it's loud um but to go into a, the race let's talk about oscar piastri for a minute let's do it he is a race winner i'm yes. very excited for him i don't know if he's excited for himself but i'm excited for him he showed like he no is. emotion it was I think so that's overshadowed. Just his personality. Yeah, I mean, he's so overshadowed, but I think that's just his personality of like not showing a lot of emotion. Um, he had a really sweet picture on his Instagram account of him just gazing down at the trophy um, and talking about how this has been a dream of his since he was a little boy. And it's just like, it's it's really nice. But I also think that his mother, Nicole Piastri, who's one of our favorite social media figures around the sport, I think she was probably a little bit more outwardly excited than he was. Yeah, no, definitely. I... I don't know. I feel bad for him because I feel like it was so overshadowed by Lando's like tantrum over the radio. Mm -hmm. And I understand why they did it, but it's also like it has to suck for Lando because it's he was so close to winning so many races and now it's one mm -hmm. more when he was like actually leading a lot of the race. So I don't know. I just yeah. I feel bad. It's it's but he, but here's the thing. They they made the decision to to, to to pit Lando first both times but also in in the second stint when Oscar was leading and that was to protect from an attack from Max who was obviously as we know struggling to get past Hamilton but that put Lando you know in front which Oscar had had the lead and Oscar probably could have I'm gonna back up a little bit Oscar and Lando both did not drive the perfect race. No. Um, obviously, Lando lost it on the line, um, you know, from, from the start. And Oscar had that really bad point in, in the middle of the race where he went from, like, five seconds up to, you know, only, like, a second and a half. So neither of them did a great job. But Oscar was fully ahead. And McLaren made the decision to pit Lando in a way that put him ahead of Oscar, which, you know... Oscar was leading the race and they really they probably should have considered something else. And I know that they were protecting Oscar in P1, but protecting Oscar in P1 by giving P1 to Lando is a dick move, you know, on their part for Lando, who is dying for another F1 victory, where Oscar is also similarly dying, come out of Lando's shadow and, you know, be an F1 race winner. And, you know, I think I, I said in our, our last episode that like Oscar will like be the championship leader into the 2030s. Yeah. But I just think that it, 
it was really dumb. There were a lot of really dumb strategy decisions from a lot of teams. And I think that McLaren was really one of the big highlights. Or low yeah, and, and like, I get it. To me, it would be different if Lando, like, was a dick and didn't listen to team orders and took over P1. And it and then they'd be like, hey, you really have to, like, give the position back. But he was only racing the race that they told him to race. And, like, he was following the strategy that they put forth. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, like, a freak thing of why he ended up in P1. So it's like, you're going to set him up to be in P1 and then just take it away from him. Like, that's kind of, that, I don't know. It's, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. The whole thing of, like, at your convenience, please let Oscar buy. And, like, that's just, like. It's not at your convenience. It's you need to let Oscar, like he, honestly, McLaren should like, should have had them switch way earlier on so that they could have avoided the situation because Lando waited until lap 67 of 70 before he finally listened. And that's after he got yelled at by his race engineer who was getting direction from Andrea Stella, who was probably also getting direction from Zach Brown, who, um, let me, let me pull up what he, what Zach Brown said on social, he, and on his Instagram post, because I thought it was really interesting. Um, he said, Mega 1 2 in Hungary, delighted for Oscar on his first win in F1, three exclamation points. Great teamwork from Lando and delivered in P2. Immense pride in the whole team who have shown um, incredible resilience and togetherness. And then in all caps, one team, one mission. And I think between the the one team one mission and then what um lando's race engineer said about like this is a team effort and you need to play the team game um i think that that was that was a clear message that lando needed to not do what lando was doing i get it and it's so hard because it's like it's a team sport but it's an individual sport at the same time Right. Also, and it really it it goes back to the fact that McLaren should never put the drivers in this situation in the first place. And no. it's, I mean, it's been a minute since they've had a one-two. So, like, I understand that they've they've ne- like the people at McLaren have probably never had to figure out a strategy for that. Yeah. Um, but but also, I think that you know when it comes to the sportsmanship side of things, one of my um, friends who I've grown up with, um, she just got into Formula One, and she is a Lewis fan who has completely and totally missed out on all the trauma that Lewis Hamilton fans have suffered from 2021 until like the last month. Um, but she until like she, last week at Silverstone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but she 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 was like, I don't like that guy who um, you know it from from the cool down room, um, which was which was Lando. She's still she's still learning, you know who who's who and what's what. Um, but I was like, yeah, Lando didn't have the best moment in in the cool down room and I know that it's probably it, it's not indicative of like who Lando Norris is and who we know of, of, of what Lando Norris is but I, I also thought that it didn't play very well especially considering Lando going into the weekend saying like I'm a nicer driver than Max and I'm a nice you know I I, I wouldn't do you know what someone like Max would do and insert dick move here and then Lando is is kind of doing the thing and it just it didn't make Lando look great No, but I'm also going to give him a pass and say, like, he was just told that he had to hand the the win over to his teammate. The easiest win of all time. Exactly. Had to hand it over, so he didn't get that. And these are, you know, world-class athletes. They're going to be freaking competitive, and they're going to be upset when that happens. So we know that's not who he is, but I'm also going to give him a pass and say, you know, if Lewis was in that situation he would be pissed too. And he has been in that situation and he has mm-hmm. been pissed. So I, yeah. don't, I don't think, um, I, think I mean, I would say that probably, about any driver who would be in this position, not I just what pissed. Lando would do. I would have handled it oh, of so course. much worse than Lando. I had, I had my own temper tantrum this morning. And if you are a listener who's spoken to me this morning on Sunday, June 21st, you know what I'm mad about. But it it goes back to McLaren putting Lando in a really bad position right. um, that makes him not look good and then play even worse because of what he had said earlier, you know, earlier in yep. the weekend. Yeah. Um so so the moral of the story is we have seven different race winners in 14 races, which is so many more than we've had in multiple years. And also, this is um, McLaren's first win in Hungary since Lewis won here in 2012. So, like, yeah. big deal day for, for McLaren. I, I really hope Oscar gets to celebrate and is celebrated in spite of the fact that this race was such a downer. Yeah, I want to highlight the seven different winners in 14 races because when we looked at the field this year we 
one said McLaren like may or may not be in the mix for like mids and they're definitely proving they're very good and they're towards the top but also mm-hmm. we never would have said seven different race winners oh I don't, no fully I don't think, never because we because both uh both Ferrari drivers have won both Mercedes drivers have won both McLaren drivers have won and then Max has won obviously right. um but it's nice to see all that kind of switch up and now that we are in the second half of the season it's really made constructors super interesting because Mm -hmm. that's like that's the only thing I got out of this weekend was how close it's going to be it's not just going to be Red Bull running away it's not going to be like how early can Max win the championship it's it's actually going to be a fight this year which I'm really excited about Oh, fully. I have, and I, I pulled up the constructor standings, um, and Red Bull is up three eighty nine to three thirty eight over McLaren. McLaren has a sixteen point advantage over Ferrari, who have th- um, three hundred twenty two points, and then Mercedes is in fourth with two hundred forty one points, way ahead of Aston Martin in fifth with sixty nine points. So these top four teams are, you know. The the top three positions are really wide open at this point. Like if Perez doesn't get his his ish together, and we'll talk about him in a second. Like you know, Red Bull Red Bull isn't in some serious danger. Um, but McLaren, I I called McLaren my dark horse of a constructor going into the season, and you know I I can very easily see them you know continuing to stay P two ahead of Ferrari. Oh, definitely, because Ferrari's not doing themselves any favors. Nope, nope. And I mean, they they ran an anonymous weekend. But before we move on um, really quick, I just want to point out that Lewis Hamilton set another Formula One record this weekend with his um, third place finish. He now has 200 podiums and that is more than anyone ever and is an absurd number of podium finishes. Are we are we doing a good highlight of Lewis Hamilton? I'm being nice for once. You no, know, this is the the facts are getting in oh, in the way of the storyline. <laughs> oh no, 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 this is this is I th- this is this is facts are facts, and this and I and you know that I love a statistical fact, I know, you know, whether or kidding. not it's for my favorite driver. But speaking of not letting the facts get in the way of a good story, um, that was in response to something that vcarb put out social media is is just so much this weekend um oh yes the double q3 finish um posts um after qualifying where yes they both did finish um in q3 um but you we also forget the fact that yuki Tsunoda crashed in q3 and didn't set a qualifying time um so that was really a a let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story moment um as my my former boss likes to say love but no, it's exciting for Lewis, and I mean, I know you won't, may or may not agree with this, which is fine, but it's exciting to see him still be able to pull podiums and drive well and finish his last year at Mercedes on a high note. I think him and Toto really did a lot with the team together, so it's just, it's a, you know, it's a happy ever after of his story with Toto at Mercedes, and then he'll go to Ferrari, and they'll just, you know, screw up Destroy the rest of his career. So it's nice to see him kind of like riding the high and going out on a good note at, at Mercedes. And it's also nice to see Mercedes come, you know, turn around from last season because they really struggled last season. And I called yeah. it that, you know, they were really going to turn it around because they were kind of progressing at the, at the end of last season. Um, so I don't know. I'm happy for him. I really am. And we love to see him in the sport. He's so good for the sport. We can't say that enough. So as long as he's driving well and performing, he'll be able to stay in the sport. And I think that's, you know, great overall for F1. Also to highlight, I don't know if we mentioned this, but he did get ESPN's award for like top English athlete. Sure. Yeah. English athlete uh, of the year. Uh, athlete of the, of like the 2000s or the 2010s or something like that. It was a weird yes. like date range, but he did get that, which if you think about it, People are like, oh, but he's a driver. He's not an athlete. But he is an athlete. He is. And what, and what other British athlete was so dominant during that time period? It was Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. So, that's cool. Yeah, exactly. We're turning yeah, into that, a pro Lewis was... podcast here. Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> no, 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 no we are not. If I can come around to Max, you can come around to Lewis. Pass. Um, but, it, you know, we usually go into, like, who else off the podium impressed. And honestly nobody else team radio was funny today or oh, you know the team, team radio, radio was like was the only so source of good. entertainment 
Um, yeah. But before we go into who else disappointed, we need to talk about Checo. Yes. Yeah. While while admitting that his race performance today was decent, he qualified P16, not. finished P7. Um, this is not what we need out of Sergio Perez. And this is not what, you know, this is not a man deserving of a two-year contract extension, especially you know, in light of the fact that Mc- McLaren is so dominant and competitive right now um, to but, start. The- but Go I want to, I want to stop because I don't think it was a good race. Like he didn't like he, I, I get, he moved up the grid a lot and he got in the points. Good for him, but yeah. he's driving the Red Bull and the Red Bull is so fast. We've seen what Max can do with the Red Bull. We've seen Max make up a lot of places with the Red Bull. So why isn't Checo doing it? He has the same exact car as Max. And I don't think he had like a great race today. I mean, he definitely didn't have a great race and took advantage of other people having worse races, which right. ended up getting him, you know, into P7. So you're right. He did not have a great race. And let's, let's like, this guy started with four podiums in five races to start the season. He finished P2 three times and P3 one time um, and finished in the top five in the first six races. But yes. since then... He's had two retirements. Uh, he finished P17 at Silverstone, where he was lapped twice, um, and in two P7s, including today, and two P8s. Um, he's qualified. I mean, we we all know that the the stats of like Logan Sargent has outqualified him so many times this season, and Logan Sargent is in a Williams that is not very good, and he's in a Red Bull. Um, but he's you know qualified in you know P11 in Imola, 16 in Canada, Spain, and Hungary. P or he he qualified P8 in Canada, um, P7 in the Austria Sprint, and P8 in the Austria Race, and then P, obviously P19 in Silverstone. And he's currently um, 141 points behind Max Verstappen, which is not where you want the second Red Bull driver to be. He's currently seventh in the drivers' championships. He's one point behind Lewis Hamilton. He should be many more points ahead of Lewis Hamilton. Um, and it's it's just it's really bad. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is attributable to his qualifying. Like, he's not doing well in quality. He's starting at the back of the grid or middle of the grid, whatever, and then he has to make up so much space. And when he's not performing well and in the car, he, he can't do that. And he's not going to be competitive because of his qualifying. And if And I don't like the argument of, like, oh, well, he did really good for where he qualified. But no, he's in a Red Bull. He should be out qualifying Logan Sargent. He should mm-hmm. be doing better for what he's what he has to work with and for his contract. Like it's so wild how people are still putting stock in him of like, oh, but he's a really good driver. Oh, he's just having Show a little me. bit of a struggle. It's like where I don't see it. I have not seen him deserving that seat all season. And I know he like the first few races he had podiums, whatever. But you have to do it all season long and you have to mm-hmm. qualify well. Qualifying is so important in this sport because it sets your grid and it sets you up for the race. And if he continues to fail on Saturdays, like, it's just, it's not, I don't think he can stay at Red Bull. I, I think it's so dumb that they gave him two years. They should have waited to see how his season went and they should never have extended him two years. No, I, I fully agree with you. So um, Helmut Marco signaled at some point throughout this weekend that they're going to look into what's going on with Checo during the summer break. And I feel like, um, and, and you can push back on this, but I feel like there are like three main options for what Red Bull is going to do. Option one, they do nothing. Checo attempts to dig himself out of the slump like he has the past couple of years and you know, is, is continues to be, you know, somewhat of a disappointment, but, you know, gets closer to top five finishes. Option two, they tear up the two-year contract and sign somebody else for 2025. Paige and Carlos signs. And then that kid doesn't need another option on his plate. He can't. But here's the, the other option is tear up the two-year contract and fire him midsummer and promote either Danny Ricardo, Yuki Sonoda, or Liam Lawson into the second Red Bull seat. And then, you know, and that opens the door for Lawson to get on the formula one grid this season, um, which, you know, 
everyone is itching for him to, to get on the grid in the Red Bull family. And it's just really hard to, you know, find a place. Um, but I also, you know, people are saying that I saw somewhere and I, I think this has to, to be nonsense, but somebody was saying that Christian Horner wants Liam Lawson in the second Red Bull seat and Helmut Marco wants Yuki Sonoda in the second Red Bull seat, which I can't believe because everything that Helmut Marco has ever said about Yuki Sonoda has signaled that he'll never that race he, for Red that, Bull. That he's, that he's never going to do it. He's never actually going to be considered. And so much of like, the media lately has been trying to like fluff up this idea of Yuki driving for Red Bull. And I'm like, stop trying to make him like, don't set him up for disappointment media. Like I, I really, I don't see Yuki driving for the main Red Bull team. Um, and I, I, I can see, you know, Liam Lawson hopping into the second Red Bull seat ahead of him, but I also yeah. could see them just saying, screw it. Let's put Ricardo in for the rest of the year, put Liam Lawson into the carb and then reconsider, you know, at the end of 2024, who's going to drive where in 2025. <sighs> I mean, honestly, I think they'll all, I, I don't think they'll do anything because they didn't do anything last season and I don't think they'll do anything this season and just it is what it is. They'll let him if anything, I think they would pull him mid season next season, but I don't think they'll do anything. The Red Bull's already struggling with all their, you know, issues. So why add one more thing into it? You know what I mean? I right, think it's right. super interesting how everyone is rooting for and thinks Danny deserves the Red Bull seat, like, Liam, like, if you think about it on paper, Liam Lawson is untested. Yes, he drove for, in a AlphaTauri last season for a free races for Daniel Ricciardo, but he's very, very much so a rookie, and mm -hmm. so are you going to take Checo out and put Liam in? Like, you're probably not going to get much better, so that, to me, leads that, like, they would move Danny or Yuki up, and then Liam would take a V-carb seat. Right. But Yuki has been outperforming Daniel all season. In every aspect, he's like every race, not every race, but almost every race he has finished ahead of Danny. And yeah. to me, that's what you would do. That is what's fair. You're the high performer on your team. You're pulling in the most points. You get the promotion. But I don't think that would happen. I think they would take Daniel. Yeah. I, I also think that they would, you know, they, they would look at it and be like, well, on paper, Yuki's done better, but it's Daniel. And like, you know, Lawson, um, he test drove um, Max's Red Bull last week, sometime in the dis not too distant past, um, and was like within two tenths of Max's qualifying times. But if you think about it, before they fired Nick DeVries, that's also the same margin that Daniel was in when they put him in the Red Bull right. car. So it really, you know, that, that statistic means nothing. Um, and it, it all really depends on what happens in the actual race. And, but, and I, I do think that in, in the sense of, you know, familiarity and what, I don't know if this, this wouldn't guarantee anything, but I think in the sense of like familiarity and known quantities, I think that they would take Daniel and promote Daniel back to Red Bull over yeah. Yuki and keep Yuki at Beacon with Lawson. Um, and I do Agreed. think it's looking more and more likely that we see, oh, I, I don't know about likely, but I think that the, the better option um, is, is either option one, they do nothing and we're in, you know, Red Bull is miserable and annoyed. And, but I, I also think that, Unlike last year, where Max was up 8,000 points ahead and was carrying the constructors battle as well. That's a I fair think point. That the, other, the other thing to consider here is what is going to be best for Red Bull's chances in the constructors championship. Because McLaren's not going anywhere. No. Ferrari's happy picking up what points they can. Um, I've always said that Mercedes is very sneaky in the way that they, you know, get solid amounts of points while having an anonymous races. So I think it's really can Checo help Red Bull to another Constructors' Championship? And I don't think the answer is yes. And if the answer is no, then I think they, if they agree that the answer is if Checo can't do it, then they'll put somebody else in the seat who they think will be, who will have a better opportunity. Yeah, man. I mean, now that McLaren's so much closer and they're, you know, consistently both landing high in the points. That's a good point is that like last season, Max carried the entire team. They pretty much didn't even need Checo. They didn't yeah. have Checo. Um, and this season, they definitely need their second driver. Max can't do it all themselves. And Christian Horner is so freaking competitive. Again, high-performing athletes, high-performing teams. Yep. He's not just going to be like, oh, we'll just ride it out. I think he would jump the gun. I just... I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. Cause they keep 
preaching like we believe in him and we've given him a contract and this is our plan and this is our strategy, whatever, but who knows? So he's been saying that, but Helmut Marco has been saying that we yeah, will consider during the summer Helmut break. Marco and I think says that Helmut Marco stuff. Well, yes, he does say a lot of things, and we know that he doesn't love Checo, but I do think that this is a situation where they will take a hard look at the Constructors' Championship chances, yeah. and I think that they might actually do something, whereas last year, they're like, why are we giving this man another one-year contract? And then he was kind of better going into, like, the latter portion of the season. Yeah. But also, your option, too, to jump to that one, Carlos signs like, if I'm him... I'm not saying it has to be Carlos, no, but I, no, no, I'm no, saying no, but that they could, could look for another guy in 25 and Carlos would be an option because he hasn't made a decision yet because he's, I don't know, going to get ready to watch the Olympics all summer. Oh, not another sporting event for him to watch. <laughs> um, but I don't think that he... Again, maybe I'm weird, but the team was like, yes, we're interested. We're going to kind of talk to you, but just kidding. We're actually going to really early sign Checo and give him two years. So it's pretty much like, go away. Why would then he come back and be like, oh, yes, yes, I would love to drive for you. Thank you. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I I, 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 I can see that. So, I, you know, it may not be Carlos Sainz. It might be another driver on the grid, question mark. I don't know who, who it would be. Um, but I, I, I do think that the season will end with Checo not having a two-year contract with Red Bull going into 2025. Um, and whether that means that he will leave after, you know, during the summer or, you know, elsewhere. I think we might, I, I honestly think that there's going to be an emergency podcast episode in our future in the next few weeks. Oh, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. But moving on to who else disappointed, Red Bull really ruined Max's strategy. And I know that, you know, sometimes Max just yells at GP, his race engineer for the sake of, you know, yelling at, at GP because, you know, that's, you know, that GP's job is to be yelled at. Um, but I, I really think that they took a page out of the Ferrari book of what the hell strategy and just have it just been so bad. Well, to be completely honest on that, I don't think they anticipated how McLaren was going to drive today. And it just like mm -hmm. threw everything for their strategy. Yeah, they de they definitely underestimated him. They underestimated Lewis in, er, in the Mercedes. Um, and I also think that the real problem here is the car and less like, I don't think this is an issue with Max. I don't care about Max staying up late to sim race. Some people are night owls. Um, and I, there was a lot of discussion on the broadcast of, you know, well, you know, Max was up really late. That's not which bad. Is that's so not good dumb. Score, which I don't care. Like that's, that's not actually the big deal here when the big deal is, I think Ted Kravitz even said like, you know, the, there's so much understeer in the car right now yeah. and Max hates driving with understeer. And I think like that, the understeer, you know, hit whatever issue he's feeling with the brakes like those are the issues that that have really been popping up not just this week but over the last few races that he's been frustrated um and I think that's that's where the real problem lies and it's not just because you know Max you know stayed up late playing video games one too many times no I completely agree I do speaking of Max because it's weird that we aren't talking about Max on this episode very much but I want your thoughts. I know we talked about it a little bit on our on our Instagram, but the no further action from the stewards on him and Lewis's incident. That is wild to me. Do you like what are your thoughts on that? So 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 my thoughts and I I read the the you know the technical explanation and one of the things that that stood out to me was that the steward said that Lewis could have done better to avoid impacting with him. And I I I think that a whatever b there's a lot of double standard because if Max was the driver ahead then Max would have gotten a 5 second penalty because he has in the past, but I also think that there was also no further action from the stewards because Max lost two positions after the impact and so like damage was already done. Yeah, but I still think it's a bad precedent and we know you know how I feel about the FIA and all their wishy-washy precedents that they make, but minimum lap time? Exactly. Um yeah. but it's saying like, "Oh, well, you know, if you caused an incident, but, like, you lost a place, you know, that's punishment enough. But, like, what happens when you have drivers... Again, this is all for safety. So what right. happens when you have drivers see it and say, like, oh, so that's all that we have to do, and then everything's okay, and we don't actually get 
larger penalties. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it was it was deemed a racing incident. And I think that's, I mean, Red Bull obviously is always going to go in, in the door to the stewards wanting the other team to be punished. Right. Um, and Lewis was very firmly in the camp of it was a racing incident. And, you know, heaven forbid I agree with Lewis, but I think Lewis was, was right in, the, in this case. Um, and I think that no further action was appropriate um based on the ultimate outcome yeah that's fair i don't know i just the it's the safety thing for me you know right. what i mean so. max's car did go flying in the last time that, that he because you couldn't see on on um on television on the broadcast but when you saw in pictures um his car went flying and the last time his car went flying like that um reminded me of like monza 2021 when that car landed on top of lewis's head um yeah. so fortunately it was it was much it was much better for both and both cars were able to stay on track so people who are saying that max hasn't learned since 2021 clearly max has learned at least a little bit um speaking tiny. of on the broadcast oh pardon oh my, my french what the fuck was going on with the drone camera I was getting sick. You couldn't see anything. It was so high up. Like, there was no point of it. I don't I don't need it. I don't want it again. It needs to go away. It was horrible. I I was lying down when I was watching most of the race this morning, and I was getting dizzy, and I don't get dizzy when getting... I'm lying down. Like, I did, did not like that. No, it was like I was getting car sick. I'm like, where am I? What's going on? Yeah, the other thing that I want to point out with the the – tv direction is they cut to like lance stroll in the pits at one point when I lewis know. and max were battling and i'm like excuse me could you go back to that like <sighs> it's so annoying like i know you've spent a good portion of the the race on max trying to get ahead of lewis but like i don't care about lance stroll in the pit no i don't, I don't care about lance stroll period i mean also that um but i yeah i just the 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 camera direction was not great and the drone camera needs to go yeah also talking about people we don't care about um alpine so mm, yes yeah really rough weekend for them sd bestie finished 18 and gasly started from the pit lane and then also had to retire the car so very forgettable they're back to their alpine ways yeah, that that this is the Alpine that we expected to see at this time this of the year. Alpine we know and love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, First few it, weeks it were was flukes. Fully, fully a fluke. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Um, oh, also to go back to to Red Bull real quick, I don't think that they're going to be able to fix whatever the hell is going on with Max in the car until after um, the summer, summer break. break. I think that Spa is going to be similarly challenging for at the very least Max. Um, I don't think that they're going to be able to get get a handle on whatever is going on over this one weekend. And I think that they it, it, after the summer break, I think Red Bull will make another charge. Oh, I love Spa. I'm so excited. I know Spa's going to be fun. Oh. All right. Well, to wrap up our Hungarian Grand Prix, we will go through our predictions, which I am just failing at miserably. So we picked pole, podium, P10. We recorded on Wednesday. Wednesday. So we do this way ahead of time. So don't fault us for anything. We don't do this when <laughs> before qualifying. So it's really hard. But for pole, it was Lando. And Catherine, you did pick Lando. And I picked Max, which, you know, usually is pretty good, but the car is struggling. So, yeah. um, so Catherine got a point for pole and then for podium, it was Oscar Lando Lewis. And we both really underestimated Oscar. <laughs> um, so you had Max Lando George. I had Lando Max Lewis. So I had two, you had one, all the wrong order and nothing matters. And then for yep. B10... It was Lance Stroll, and you did pick an Aston Martin. You picked Fernando, though, so it was the wrong Aston Martin. Oops. And then I gave Checo a little bit of credit to get P10, and honestly, I wasn't far off. So. No. Yeah. But for my biggest surprise, I said that Checo would have a weekend in the points, and he did. He finished P7, even though it wasn't impressive, and it's not where, you know, it's not where the expectations are for, for where he should be. Right. And I said that we were going to get double points for Alpine and that LOL. just absolutely did not happen. Um, for a dumb though, we both picked Ferrari and I would say like it was very anonymous from them this weekend. It, they didn't yeah. do anything great. They didn't do anything bad. They finished like midway through the points. So 
you know, anonymous. Eh, bye. Yeah, it was it was very anonymous. I wouldn't give us the the dumb. I do think that there was a moment where Leclerc was like, let's consider plan C. And I think I, I DM'd you and I, I said, oh, look, he's being race driver and race strategist again. Um, but yeah, it was. Eh, yeah. Eh. yeah. 100%. Well, with the pred- pre- uh, with the predictions, Catherine, you are at 24 points. I'm at 14. I only need one good weekend, though. Holding one good weekend one good gets weekend, you right in the mix. Back. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but final thoughts. I always enjoy Hungary, but I thought it was very meh. But yeah. its result from a meh weekend has made the standings for both driver and constructor more exciting and entertaining. So, and I think that's this whole season, this whole, like, let's say the mid chunk of the season races are closer. We have a ton more winners and it's, it's getting exciting. I'm very the, this, the, the race was not exciting. The race also completely detracted from, uh, you know, Oscar Piastri's accomplishment of becoming an F1 race winner, which is not easy to do in the grand scheme of the right. sport in general. Um, Cause if, I mean, if you look at there, there's a significant portion of drivers on the grid who have very little hope of, of becoming a race winner this season, though also anything goes. So maybe we will see Nico Hulkenberg to, on the top step of the podium at some point. I mean, it probably not, but something weird could happen. When pigs fly, Catherine. Yes, but the, the point is is that, you know, this was a really exciting moment for Oscar that was completely overshadowed by a number of terrible strategy decisions and just a really meh, boring race. Um, yeah, it, it, this, is, this is not one for the history books other than the footnote of Oscar's victory. And Hamilton's 200th podium. Ah, uh, yes, that, that's statistical. statistical. That's the real yeah. history book. <laughs> yes, that, that history. That history. All right. Well, that is the end of the episode. But before we leave, Catherine, we need your fun fact. So what is your F1 fun fact for us for today? So we always talk about how old, you know, drivers like Fernando and Lewis are. You know, Fernando is, you know, 42. Lewis is almost 40. Um, But back in the days of like the first, you know, Formula One races back in 1950, the average age of drivers was 39 years old. You know, at Silverstone, there were three drivers who were 50 or over um, and five of the drivers were over 40 years old, including the winner who was 43. Um, The youngest racer um, of the 1950 Silverstone race was 29 years old. So, you know, it's fascinating to me just how the age, you know, range of drivers has shifted so young. And, you know, I haven't done the math on the average age of the current formula one grid in comparison. It's young. But it's it's so much younger than that because Fernando is a statistical outlier. Oscar Piastri is the youngest driver on the grid. Um, you know, next year when Ollie Behrman comes on, that'll you know skew it even younger. Um, but it's just it's so interesting to me just like how the age range of Formula One drivers has just slowly gotten younger and younger and younger and younger to you know these these. 18, 19 year old phenoms. And obviously most of the grid are like in their early twenties at this point or early to mid, um, but it's still very young. But it's also goes to show like how the sport has changed. Cause we're not like oh, bouncing fully. around in like cars going 70 miles per hour anymore. Like we are pulling G's yes. and the reaction time has to be faster and you start to lose your, those motor skills or the, the sharpness of those motor skills, the more that you age. So mm-hmm. it makes sense. And yeah, fully. Yeah. So, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, thank you for the F1 fun fact. Up Anytime. next, we have the Belgian Grand Prix, which is Spa, which is probably my favorite race, I want to say. Ooh. Yeah, I think it's my favorite race. We'll, we'll give it that accolade. But we will have that prediction episode out for you guys on Friday. Catherine has camp things, so we will record a day later so that'll be out Friday before, maybe before time zones. I will schedule European it to, <laughs> I, I, will, I will schedule it um, to go out before FP1. I will not be yes. awake for FP1 and hopefully I will not, I will not be editing for FP1, which is Ugh. probably going to be like at 4.30 in the morning because um, that's what it is usually when it's in that area of Europe for us. Um but yeah, it, I I have to I have to go do some some camp stuff, and I will be unavailable. So we will be recording on Thursday to get the episode out for you guys on Friday. 
Thanks yes, for bearing yes. with us on our weird summer <laughs> schedule. Yes, exactly. Hopefully, you know, we can keep it all going. And I'm, you know, also not helping because of my repatriation. So, yeah, you know, it's fine. But we're back. This is my first full weekend, race weekend back. So it's super, super exciting to be back. I'm really looking forward to spa. But yes. So, yes. Well, that has been the episode. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. Great. I feel like for such a nothing burger of the race, we had so much to talk about. Well, we just about. talked about like this, the, oh, fuck, I wanted to talk about something. What? God damn it. What? I want to, I want to know, maybe we can just clip this. Is Zach Brown going to have a sleeve? Are we going for the sleeve effect? Does Oscar <laughs> get a tattoo? I want to know these things. This is what, this is what I want to know. Because if he doesn't get a tattoo... I would leave the team. I'd be pissed. He got a tattoo for Danny's win. He got a tattoo for Lando's win. Where is the Hungarian Grand Prix track tattoo going is to be, be on like Zach Brown's body? Tat? I feel like he's running out of like big surface area. It's either going to be like a tramp stamp or a thigh tat. Like that is what I envision for Oscar Piastri. And I hope that Nicole gets a matching one. I I really hope that Nicole Piastri celebrates her brains out for, <laughs> you know, how excited she is for her son and for, for, for the fact that she can't bring herself to go to races because she's terrified. I um, like, I, I hope that she's able to, you know, celebrate with all of their friends back in Australia for this win. Oh, yeah. uh, man. But yeah, that, that was my one question coming out of this weekend. Not like, what's going to happen with Checo's seat? What's going to happen here? It's where is Zach Brown getting Oscar's winning tattoo? And is he? That is, these are the important questions we need to ask. Yes. Yes. And, and that is your postscript. And here's the real ending to the podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, things are going off track with this, guys.